um, they, we didn't, um, in five years of rabbinic school, um, we had uh, basically one afternoon uh, that talked a little bit about mysticism. Um, where we went to school, uh, they believed in Wissenschaftsjudentums, Judentums, uh, the science of Judaism. And um, so uh, Jewish life uh, uh, ended at the uh, Eastern border of Germany. Uh, that was Jewish intellectual thought. And um, so in the reform movement, actually, there are two poles. Um, one pole is uh, the Hasidic pole, and the pole is the rationalist pole. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, our rabbinic school is, um, you know, rationalist intellectual institution. So um, the youth movement is all about, um, you know, kind of ecstasy. Uh, you know, if you've been to a song session at camp, um, at, when they lift up the song leader, um, uh, Mara, this one's for you. Um, and um, that's what it's uh, about. And um, so during um, the last, uh, you know, 35, 40 years, um, mysticism has uh, come in to the mainstream. And, um, you know, I learned um, about, uh, and I, I use the word mysticism rather than Kabbalah. Um, and um, Kabbalah is a specific genre under Jewish mysticism. Um, and, um, so I learned uh, through the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, uh, which has um, become very much uh, mainstream. And um, I was in the first cohort of rabbis that trained there. Uh, Rick Jacobs was in that, uh, that cohort. Um, and um, it combined uh, Hasidic thought with um, with meditation. And uh, Rabbi um, Art Green, uh, Rabbi Dr. Art Green, um, was one of the teachers. He um, is now the chancellor of the rabbinic program at Hebrew College in Boston. And uh, Sylvia Borstein, for those of you that uh, have uh, done stuff with meditation, um, was um, one of the, uh, uh, was our instructor in meditation. And um, so that kind of opened me to this world. And um, I uh, spent a lot of time at a Jewish spiritual retreat center called Elat Chaim. And um, then I, I spent a year in Israel, uh, but the focus there was Talmud. And um, so I've spent um, a lot of time uh, learning Hasidic texts. Um, and usually when we think of um, Hasidut, um, we think of um, the stories, but there's a, a whole series of drashot that uh, the different rabbis would give to their uh, students, and uh, they'd speak on Shabbat, and then people would write them down uh, after Shabbat, and these were combined into various works. Um, and so um, there is so much out there now. If uh, you see somebody wants to sell you a book called The Kabbalah, don't buy it. Because um, there's no one book of Kabbalah. Usually, technically, when they, they talk about Kabbalah, uh, we're referring to the mysticism, um, believe it or not, from Spain um, in the Middle Ages. But what I'm going to try to do is uh, take us on a journey from the uh, beginnings of uh, Jewish mysticism uh, through the ages and combine uh, two sort of tracks. Uh, one track will be how these ideas relate to our lives. And the other is to um, really explore the, the texts with you uh, directly. Um, uh, we're not gonna be tying any uh, red strings around our wrists this evening, not even next week or the week after. Um, but um, 
the way that um, I approach it is um, Art Green uh, uh, spoke of um, Jewish mysticism as psycho-spiritual literature. So, um, you know, I am a student and uh, there are, you know, people there, you know, that uh, are incredibly knowledgeable. And this is, um, you know, sort of our opening uh, together. So um, what I want to start with uh, this evening, uh, we'll go to um, uh, some, uh, start with a little PowerPoint because what's a, uh, what's an online class without a PowerPoint? Um, and uh, um, so um, here are, you know, the questions. This is actually the week in review is, this is um, uh, the review sheet, but I want to um, start, you know, use this as our introduction uh, because we're online. Um, ordinarily, and I can send everyone um, the source book. Um, and, um, so um, what we're going to um, look at um, are really four questions. The first question is, how did the how do mystics view the world? You know, what's their their way of thinking about the world? Um, then in the Torah, they asked, what is God like? Um, and um, this will sort of blow your mind a little bit. And then um, the rabbis um, will ask the question, so now that I know what God is like, how do I commune and how do I connect with God? And then the earliest mystics also said, how did God create the world? So those are, are the questions that we're gonna look at this evening. So let's start with a story. And it's the story of the country mouse and the city mouse. And uh, the story goes like this. Uh, there were once uh, two mice and they went out to uh, the country and they saw this beautiful field. And um, then as they were watching, uh, there was uh, a man that came and um, he started with um, uh, what we know as a plow, but they saw a horse and uh, something and digging these furrows in the field. And um, one of the mice said, oh, this is just ridiculous uh, that uh, there's this beautiful field and this farmer is just digging it up. And um, they watched a little longer and um, they, uh, they see that the farmer has this bag and it's um, full of seed um, and you know, grain, and, and he starts throwing it into the furrows. And the, um, the, the mouse who's a little more um, judgmental says, oh my God, what a waste. He's getting rid of all of this wonderful, wonderful, and we could be eating that. And he throws up his paws and he goes back into the city. Well, the, uh, the second mouse, um, we'll call this mouse the country mouse. It's a, a little more patient and sees that um, over uh, time, over a few weeks, that, um, that uh, the wheat, uh, that the seeds now begin to grow. And um, it grows taller and taller. And um, these beautiful plants. And so the, um, the, the mouse sends uh, a, a text to uh, the city mouse and says, you know, come on out and see what happened. And the mouse comes out and sees what happened. And um, amazing, these, you know, beautiful stalks, you know, grow. And, um, and then they're watching and then the farmer uh, takes uh, this long knife, a sickle and starts cutting it down. And the city mouse now is totally disgusted and throws up his paws and says, ah, enough is enough. And so um, goes back to the city. Well, the country mouse watches as um, what we know as uh, wheat is uh, then harvested and the chaff is separated from the wheat. It's a process called winnowing. 
when I was in yeshiva in Israel, my uh, halacha teacher always liked to use winnowing. So I have to work it in at least once um, in honor of Svi. And uh, then the, uh, the grain was ground up into flour and there was bread and ah, the, uh, the, um, uh, the country mouse saw this wonder. So um, one point of view of the mystic is looking at the big picture of everything. And um, uh, in uh, Hasidic thought, uh, this is called um, Mohin de Gadlut, um, Gadol from big. So it's the, the superstructure, the big, the meta structure of the world. But the, um, the Hasid is doing a second thing at the same time. And um, just for the sake of um, uh, completeness, um, uh, then um, this is the, uh, the other picture. And um, this is uh, actually, it's not the other picture because uh, you can't see it because I didn't share it. Um, but now you'll be able to see it. Um, and um, uh, this is um, a illustrated version of a story by the Yiddish writer, um, I.L. Peretz, and uh, it's called If Not Higher. Um, when I was in Poland um, and went to Warsaw, I, was, I went to the grave of Peretz. And uh, the story goes like this. Um, that in the town of Nimrov, uh, the people said that um, uh, every year before the high holidays, um, that their Rebbe, the Rebbe of Nimrov, would go to heaven to plead for the congregation. And uh, a skeptic, um, uh, if you know the Yiddish Litvak, um, came into town and said, even Moses, you know, didn't go to heaven. How could... Um, the, the rabbi go to heaven. And so he decides he's going to find out where the rabbi goes. And um, so he sneaks into the rabbi's house and hides under his bed. Only in these kind of stories does this happen. And um, so it's dawn and um, everybody wakes up and they're going to, to shul and they're going to be adding the slichot prayers, the penitential prayers. The rabbi stays in bed, and I uh, figures, ah, the rabbi sleeps in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch him. And uh, so, the um, uh, but a little while later, uh, the rabbi gets up, and instead of the usual clothes, he puts on heavy work clothes, and gets a length of uh, rope and an axe, and uh, heads out into the forest. And there, there's a, a tree that fell, and uh, the Rebbe starts chopping it up and putting it into a big bundle of wood. And all the while, the skeptic is following the Rebbe and uh, follows him to the outskirts of town. And there, there is a small cottage, and the Rebbe knocks on the door, boom, boom, and there's a frail voice and the, uh, who says, who is it? And the Rebbe now posing as a pe Russian peasant says, it's Misha and I have wood to sell. And before the person could even protest, I don't have any money, goes in and uh, brings in the wood. And the person says, but I don't have any money. And the um, Rebbe, uh, you know, disguised now as a peasant says, your God will provide. And so the Rebbe stacks the wood and begins um, uh, to uh, set a fire. And all this time, the skeptic is, the cynic really, is looking in through the window and sees the Rebbe um, building the fire. But the skeptic notices that the Rebbe's lips are moving. And the Rebbe, as the fire is just catching, says the first part of the Slicha prayers. And as it's beginning to grow a little more, says the second part. And as it's a comfortable fire, the third part of the prayers, and there's wood left, 
and the Rebbe goes back into town. And so um, when the Rebbe goes into town, the, the, the skeptic follows him and is now in the middle of the town square as people are coming out of uh, the shul. And when I'm telling you this story, I have in mind a village called Tikuchin in Poland, um, where there was a, a stone synagogue and uh, uh, it's a village that yeah, I was there when I was uh, in Poland. And um, they said, so did you find our Rebbe and where does our Rebbe go? Does our Rebbe go to heaven? And the skeptic says, if not higher, does your Rebbe go? If not higher. Um, it's, a, it's a fun story, but it illustrates the second piece, the second tension that, um, that a mystic holds. That on one hand, there is mochin de Godwood, and on the other hand, every moment is sacred. Everything is interconnected and everything is sacred. And the mystic is holding two ideas in tension. And so one of the things about um, how I'll be um, sharing the sources with you is um, that uh, a lot of people in the uh, liberal uh, world, which we call the neo-Hasidic world, um, you know, focus on everything being interconnected. But they don't necessarily focus on the personal connection with, uh, with the divine. Um, my teacher in Jerusalem, who maybe we'll have a class with uh, this year, Rabbi Levi Cooper, uh, who um, is a boy, uh, Boyan Hasid uh, from that dynasty, but he's a modern guy with a PhD from Bar Ilan University. You know, he says that you know, in the Hasidic world, we're holding two ideas in tension. The um, everything is the world, and, uh, and also that um, we're personally connected to God. And so that's um, where I'll come from with this. So um, uh, let me just uh, pause for a second and um, see if there are any questions or comments or rebuttals. And um, you know, pardon me, because if we were in person, I would be asking everybody to, uh, to introduce uh, themselves and, um, um, uh, but you know, with this format, we don't necessarily uh, do it that way. So um, feel free to unmute and uh, if you have any questions or comments or rebuttals. I have a great way of killing conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, it usually takes uh, a few minutes for people to uh, to formulate questions. Okay, so we're looking to see how entertaining I'll be. Um, and um, wait, I have a question. Great. So, do you think if any of this was written by women, it would be different in the mysticism thing? Or are there books by women in this? Um, so um, uh, the, uh, the answer is that, that this was um, primarily a, a male tradition. Um, and uh, as we'll you know, see later on, it was really taught for, for generations um, from one teacher to one, one student. Um, and um, so you'll see, I, um, you know, my sense and, you know, your ideas are, are also is that um, uh, if written by women, um, it would probably have, uh, have different imagery. And also it's um, uh, a very heteronormative tradition. Um, and uh, so it's uh, male, female, um, uh, which we'll get to later on. And um, uh, but a lot, a lot of the uh, there's a, um, a lot of the imagery is uh, is that of uh, of um, of the bride and male and female, and um, part of this within the Zohar tradition is uh, in response to um, uh, to celibacy within the church and uh, the um, 
uh, the mystical tradition is uh, is much much different. Um, so I, I I think you know I did a Torah study class with um, uh, you know years and years ago, and uh, there were a, a group of women studying uh, uh, the binding of Isaac, and um, uh, you know their take on it was uh, was very very uh, different. Um, I will tell you that you know. At the spiritual retreat center, we had a mishpacha group in at the end of the day, where we talk about our experience of the day for about a, an hour or so. And it happened that there was one mishpacha group where it was eleven women and me as the facilitator. Um, man, that was an interesting experience. But I will tell you that I think my presence uh, did change the dynamic of the group. Um, it's fascinating. Rabbi, I have a question. Sure. Um, I missed a little bit of what you said at the beginning because I had to step away for a second. Mm -hmm. You are differentiating three different things that our teachings tell us. The third, the first was something along the lines of what is like maybe it was what what is this world and where do we fit into it? I missed that one. And the second was who is God? And then third, mysticism con concerns itself with how do I commune with God? Could you just Repeat briefly, what were the first and second? Yeah. So the first one is the vision of the mystics. How does the mystic see the world? And that's what we just did with the two stories that I shared with you. Um, okay. The second one is, um, what is God like? Um, you know, Moses, um, uh, after the story of the golden calf, is lonely and says, you know, God, uh, let me see your face. And God says, uh, no one can see my face and live. Uh, and I'll put you in a cleft of the rock and I'll cover you with my hand. And um, then um, you, uh, I'll pass by and you can see my back. So um, they're concerned with what is God like? And we're going to see what God was like. Okay. And then the next one is, how do I commune with God? When I know what God is like, how do I commune? And then how did God create the world? Okay. So those are, are the questions. And Thank you. Um, got it. Great. And it, you know, if folks, if you write your email address in um, uh, in the the chat, uh, then I'll ask Tammy to save the chat and I'll send you out uh, the source book um, that um, that I'll be working from. Great. Other questions or thoughts? Rabbi, we actually, this is Tammy, we actually have everyone's email when okay. they signed up for the class. So okay. I can send you that list or I can forward whatever you need me to. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll actually send you the source book. It has pictures okay. in it. Um, and um, then you can, um, uh, and then everybody can, you know, see the text we've studied. It won't make sense that, you know, it's a, it's a source book of texts. So without the conversation of the class, it won't much make sense. But once, you know, it's there, then it, it will. Great. Other uh, thoughts or questions? Great. Rabbi, it, it seems like at least to the modern mind that the two ways of looking at this are not in conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought um, it was either. Well, for some people it is. Um, and um, the, the difference between religion and philosophy is that philosophy likes nice straight lines uh, often. And religion will hold two things in tension at the same time. So, um, so there are people that, um, uh, that teach this material uh, that will, um, you know, do the everything is connected in the world. And um, that's what I believe. And if you don't like it, um, you should learn with, from somebody else. So there, <laughs> um, uh, I'll tell you that story as we get there. Um, but, um, you know, mystics can be, you know, we um, were, um, we like, you know, male or female, um, any sexual orientation, um, uh, you know, 
um, any age, any skin color, but you had certainly better believe what we believe about God. <laughs> this is Sandy. I have a question. Um, my understanding um, from years ago when I was first learning about uh, Jewish mysticism was that um, that originally it was thought that it should only be taught to men uh, at least age 40, married and with a thorough understanding of Torah and Talmud and that otherwise there was a risk of someone uh, going crazy, essentially losing their mind. What are, what are your, what are modern Jewish thoughts about that? About that. Um, so yeah, that, that, what, that was the, the tradition. And um, uh, so we'll get to it, you know, a little bit, we'll get to it a little bit this evening, but mystical thought can be very seductive. And um, so I can see the, the grounding for that. But, you know, I was um, uh, going to spend a, um, uh, a week studying the Zohar, which is the classic work of Jewish mysticism, uh, with Dr. Danny Matt. Uh, Danny um, uh, has written the um, modern translation of the Zohar. And I was interested in learning uh, about the work of this um, rabbi, the Chofetz Chaim, um, who talks about uh, proper speech, um, you know, avoiding Lashon Hara. So I tracked down the Chofetz Chaim Center, and I figured I'd try to ingratiate myself with the person on the other end of the phone and said, oh, I'm going this week to learn Zohar. And she said, oh, you better not. It's very dangerous. Um, so the other thing to know about this literature is that um, the teachers of Zohar uh, and of mysticism, the great Hasidic sages, they had all of the tradition memorized. Um, they um, had, their, in the same way that we have song lyrics memorized, they had the tradition memorized. Um, uh, yeah, there's the, the tradition of reading um, one um, page of Talmud front and back a day um, it's called Daf Yomi. It takes you seven years to go through it. Um, I, yeah, there's the fine line between genius and idiot savant. And I once um, spent time with a, a gentleman who had gone through the Talmud uh, five times. And you could throw out a word and he would just like, you know, just be rattling off stuff. Um, you could know the Talmud by the pin method. Um, you put a pin down and you read three words and the person completes the sentence. And um, so all of Jewish literature builds on itself. So um, without that, um, that deeper knowledge of the sources, uh, things also just don't make sense in the same way. Great, other questions? Uh, great. Um, so let's um, go on and, uh, and look at our first source. Um, give me one second here to get the file open. And um, Uh, okay. Oops. Um, I hit the wrong button. Excuse me a second. Uh, I'm going to enlarge the text so that uh, hopefully everybody uh, can read it. Um, uh, 
I'm um, hoping that's a comfortable size for folks. Um, so, oh, we didn't do the blessing for studying Torah. Um, so the last three words are la asok the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kitshanu v'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Um, so here is our first source, and it comes from the book of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah is a prophet who speaks to the Israelites, uh, who speaks to, to the people um, uh, before and after the fall of the temple um, in 586. The first part of the book is before the fall of the temple. And the second part of, I, the latter part of Isaiah is a book of comfort for when the people are in exile in Babylon. In the year that King Uzziah died, I beheld my Lord, and I, I am using the, uh, the more male language in just this particular context, seated on a high and lofty throne, and the skirt of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood in attendance on him. Each of them had six wings, With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his legs. And with two, he would fly. And one would call to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His presence fills all the earth. I wonder if that sounds familiar to anybody. Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavaot. And this last line, his presence fills all the earth. Um, that is um, uh, a, um, uh, a very common line in Hasidic texts. Um, the door would shake at the sound of the one who called, and the house kept filling with smoke. Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my own eyes have beheld the King, Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew over to me with a live coal, that's what's happening here, which he had taken from the altar and he touched it to my lips. Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt shall depart and your sin be purged away. Whoa! Now, you think that's wild, Wait till I take you to the prophet Ezekiel. And um, Ezekiel uh, spoke to uh, the uh, people when they were in exile in Babylon. In the 13th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, when I was in the community of exiles by the Chabar Canal, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Joachim. The word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, of, uh, by the Hebar Canal, in the land of the Chaldeans. And the hand of the Lord came upon him there. I looked, and lo, a stormy wind came sweeping out of the north. A huge cloud and flashing fire surrounded by radiance. In the center of it, in the center of the fire, a gleam as of amber. In the center of it were all the figures of four creatures. And this was their appearance. They had figures like a man. Each of them had a man's face at the front. Each of the four had the face of a lion at the right. And each of the four had the face of an ox on the left. And each of the four had the face of an eagle at the back. As I gazed on the creatures, I saw one wheel on the ground next to each of the four-faced creatures. As for the appearance of the structure of the wheels, they gleamed like barrel. Above the head of the creatures was a form, an expanse 
with an awe-inspiring gleam as of crystal was spread out above their heads. Under the expanse, each had a pair of wings extended towards the others. And above the expanse over their head was the semblance of a throne and the appearance like sapphire. On the top of the, of the semblance of a throne, there was the semblance of a human form. So you can see the artist's interpretation of the throne and the, um, the eagles uh, and the angels. Um, this was the appearance of the semblance of the presence of the Lord. When I beheld it, I flung myself down on my face and I heard the voice of someone speaking. Wow, man, this, we don't teach this in Sunday school. <laughs> so uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, uh, I, I'm going to suggest that um, that Rabbi Gorbin include this in her We Don't Teach This Stuff um, course. So when people talk about the image of God as um, a uh, uh, someone sitting on a throne up in the heavens, this is where it comes from. I actually thought a little of Hinduism with the four faces and the multiple figures. And it reminded me very much of the images you see on Hindi temples. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I think to, uh, I'm sorry, a Christian thing, because you, you know, they always show pictures of God and his throne and everything. And that's what I think most of us think of because of that, because we live in the Christian world and see that all the time. Yeah, and um, so for large swaths of Jewish history, um, we didn't uh, make images, um, uh, you know, of God. There, there were, there were though actually images of human uh, of forms in the um, Dura Europa uh, synagogue, um, but uh, you know, in Judaism, our forms of art were. Uh, you know, it's like the illustrated Haggadah, um, you know, illuminated Haggadah. But we didn't uh, make forms like this. Yeah, you know, these pictures are, aren't coming from uh, specifically Jewish sources. The image, the imagery reminds me of, I read the book of Revelation or Revelations uh, and the, um, the figures, the imagery, imagery reminds me of that. Yeah. Well, it, it might be derivative. Any it seem like visions, right? Yeah. That are being reported and brought into the Torah mm -hmm. or into, right. Yeah. Don't you think it's because people have to see something? I mean, for us, you know, when we just think of God as, you know, the the air and the, everything, it's its hard for people to get their head around that. You know, yeah. you need an image so you can see something in order to believe in it. Yeah, yeah, it, may, it makes it much more tangible. Uh, you know, I was, um, uh, you know, for, um, you know, I think many of us grew up with the male language. Uh, you know, when I was starting my career as a rabbi, we uh, you know tried to be you know gender neutral in language, and um, uh, I had a wonderful lesson from a tenth grader. I asked the kids to write you know interpretations of things uh, for uh, the confirmation service, and this one young woman uh, wrote um, that during the silent prayer, uh, you know first uh, she played with her dad's talis, then she counted yarmulkes and then she pretended to be a mind reader and now she talks to God and she is a friend that I can talk to and <laughs> she understands me. So trying to be gender inclusive I changed it to I took out the female language and being a teenager when she read it in the service she put it back in. Um, 
And it gave me the, this insight that really has shaped my thinking since is that there are a multiplicity of words and phrases, both male and female, um, to um, express different um, aspects of the, uh, of the divine. And um, so uh, I like uh, both male and female imagery now. Also, the figures around God are so terrifying. It makes God seem very far away and unapproachable. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think the purpose of describing God that way was? I mean, I think maybe first there's a question of, did that really happen? Or was that someone's dream or personal the, the height of their imagination mm -hmm. either way <laughs> how did that end up in torah yeah uh, uh, what does it, what do you think that means that we're going to describe god that way uh well i think you know torah um it is uh multivocal and that um, one of my teachers, uh, Judy Klitschner, who does marvelous, marvelous stuff, uh, her book is called Subversive Sequels. And she will suggest that there may be an idea in one part of the Torah, and later on the Torah will um, reinterpret uh, that idea in a different light. So while we have that, uh, the image of the terrifying God, um, then there's also um, God um, uh, being uh, the still small voice um, that speaks. And uh, I, I imagine it's, um, you know, different people writing about uh, the divine um, through different lenses. I wonder about the context because it was during the exile mm -hmm. that this visions were purported to come out and and emerge and that it may have been trying to speak to something about what the way they people or people were experiencing God or needed to re-image God. Yeah. Yeah, God is all powerful. Um, but you know when the children of Israel crossed through the Red Sea, uh, it says, you know, God is a man of war uh, and uses all of this uh, martial imagery uh, to refer to God. So the, the main takeaway here is um, uh, that um, the earliest strata of mysticism are... Um, building are, are based on these ideas of uh, God as uh, this all-powerful figure. Yeah, so uh, you don't have to remember the text, the sources, you can look over them, you know, share them with your friends. Um, and, um, but the, the, you know, the simple takeaway is, uh, is the imagery. So the next um, texts we're going to look at um, are texts that move on to the next question. We now we've looked at the first question, which is uh, well. The, the first question was the vision of the mystics. The second question is what is God like, and now the next question is how do I commune with God? So how do I connect with God? And um, in the literature, this is called the mysticism um, of the palace. It's Hechalot, or it's also called mysticism of the chariot, of the Mirkava. And um, so um, this is um, uh, a work um, uh, from this uh, next period. Uh, from uh, around the fifth century. 
Um, and it's the book of Enoch. And um, again, what um, we're just going to see is um, how Enoch is um, approaching the divine. Rabbi Ishmael ascends to the heaven to witness the vision of the Merkabah, the chariot. He is given to Metatron. Metatron is one of the angels. Um, if you want a fun movie, you can't actually find it online. It's Dogma, which is a movie about um, based on Christian mythology uh, with um, Will Smith, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and uh, Chris Rock, and a whole cast of characters. So loads of fun. I ascended on high to witness the vision of the Mirkava, the vine chariot. And I had entered the six halls which are situated within one another. As soon as I reached the door of the seventh, I stood still in prayer before the Holy One, blessed be he. I lifted my eyes on high towards the divine majesty and I said, Lord of the universe, I pray you that the worthiness of Aaron, the son of Amron, who loves and pursues peace. So as I said, everything builds on everything else. In Pirkei Avot, it says, be like the sons of Aaron, uh, who love peace, pursue peace, and draw people to the Torah. So that would just seem like a throwaway phrase. I happen to have that little phrase memorized. And he receives the crown of priesthood from your glory on Mount Sinai, be upon me this hour. At this moment, the Holy One blessed me, sent Metatron his servant, also called Ebed to me. He is the angel of the prince of the presence. With great joy, he spread his wings and came to me in order to save me with their hand. And by his hand, he took me so that uh, they could see us. And he said to me, enter in peace before the high exalted king and see the picture of the Mirkava, the chariot. Wow, oh, this is not stuff we are teaching our kids in religious school. But um, in this tradition, people would fast. They would um, study at night. Um, my teacher, Malila Helner, uh, talks about that in the Zohar community, uh, people would sleep until midnight and then get up and study till dawn. And midnight, you know, the dark hours are the time of poetry. You can't tell if something is an animal or a bush necessarily. And, um, you know, it, you know, when we would um, prepare to learn Zohar with Malila, she'd either read poetry or have us listen to jazz. And so, um, you know, in this period, um, people wanted to come in touch with the presence of the divine. So thoughts about that, you know, today, you know, if uh, in the Christian world, they talk about discernment, you know, that um, I discern what God wants me to do. Uh, and they talk about the call to the ministry. Um, and uh, so it's a very different vocabulary uh, than in, uh, in Judaism. So let me uh, pause there for some questions and comments and, uh, and rebuttals. I'm sorry, what, what is the takeaway from what we just saw? The, the simple takeaway is that there is a whole tradition of people wanting to commune with God. Um, that, you know, in the way that people, you know, uh, might go on a vision quest, um, that uh, there is an early mystical tradition of um, the mystic trying to know the nature and come into the presence of God. And so the mystic would ascend through different levels uh, to reach the, the palace 
uh, you know, the chariot um, where they could experience the presence of the divine. It's the, the immediacy of contact with the divine. And yeah. so the, um, the texts um, serve as, uh, and text study uh, serve as vehicles and in effect as a mechanism of spiritual technology toward that end. Like this is the mechanism that these individuals were using for the ascent. Is that? That's it exactly. That's it exactly. And the thing that we'll get to later on is that the text is not meant to be taken literally. There are, you know, deep and hidden images uh, and hidden meetings within the text. But yeah, this is the technology. By studying the text, um, meditating on it, um, that they're able to come into the presence of the divine. Um, you know, if you think of um, uh, the Sufi and the whirling dervish, the dervishes actually don't roll all that fast. Uh, I don't know if you, how many of you have ever seen dervishes. Um, and, um, uh, but, um, it, but it's the movement uh, sets one in a, a place uh, where you're connecting through to, the, to the divine through uh, a form of ecstasy. But he came down to Moses. Yeah, well, Moses is considered unique. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, Moses, there's like no prophet arises like Moses. So the quality, the experience of Moses is qualitatively different. So everybody else has to go up. Yeah. He's uh, not coming to see anybody else down here, uh, <laughs> except for Moses. For Moses, yeah, yeah. Okay, then, got it. Okay. Yeah. There's this idea of ascent. Yeah, so the um, Maimonides will say that um, Moses is awake and alert when um, when communicating with God and all the other prophets are through dreams and visions. But so, isn't it interesting then because, you know, growing up, you never think, oi, Moses is the only one he comes down to, you know, you never think that. Yeah. You never think that everybody else has to go up. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what we've looked at is that there is this image of uh, God on the throne, and there is a, uh, a technology for coming in touch with, with God. Okay, now we're going to talk about the dangers of this, because um, this can be very dangerous stuff, as we said in the, uh, in the beginning. So this is um, uh, this is a very very famous text. It comes uh, from the Talmud. The sages taught, four entered paradise, dealt with the loftiest secrets of Torah. They are as follows. Ben Azai ben Zoman Acher, he becomes a apostate, and Rabbi Akiva. Ben Azai glimpsed the divine presence and died. Ben Zoma glimpsed the divine presence and was harmed, you know, went insane. Acher chopped down the shoots. In other words, he became a heretic. And Rabbi Akiva, came out safely. Um, so um, this is um, the, the dangers of the mystic's quest. So let me, um, let me uh, bring this to life a little bit. So um, when I was uh, living in New York and serving a congregation, really getting into this stuff, um, there was about a four or five month period where I did a wide range of spiritual practices. 
So I started in December with an eight day silent meditation retreat. It's not that I don't talk, it's that no one talks to me. Um, and it's amazing that the person that's sitting in front of you will stay up all night finding a really annoying way to sit just to annoy you. Um, it's part of meditation, just telling stories. Um, they're not really doing that, but that's what you come to believe after all this silence. Um, and um, then um, uh, a few months later, I did um, an ecstatic retreat. And the um, idea was that we were singing and dancing and singing and dancing. And um, in, in essence, the guy leading the retreat, you know, was trying to bring us to do a channeling in this form of mystical writing, where you just, you know, sing verses of Psalms and you dance, and then you just write. And it, you know, the idea is, uh, is channeling the divine. So then about a month later, I did Musar for um, uh, four or five days, which a Jew, it's a Jewish ethical practice. And then a month after that, I did another silent retreat, but this one was even more silent than the first one, because uh, the first one had these, uh, these other mis, uh, type forms of Jewish meditation in, but this was all silence. And you know how you wake up in the morning, you can tell you know, sort of what time it is? I would wake up in the morning, I couldn't tell you what day it was. Um, because you know, I was mixing different spiritual practices and um, it really, it became very, very disorienting. Um, you know, I wasn't um, seeking to experience the divine, but you know, that's where you know, we get the idea of needing to be above the age of 40, being married for grounding. Um, uh, Rabbi Dr. Larry Hoffman, um, he's not really into mysticism, by the way. Um, he, um, uh, you know, we were talking about this at one point, and, you know, he was telling me about someone who was so intent on, you know, studying these mystical texts that he stopped, you know, he didn't eat much and, and his health, um, came to suffer uh, because of, of so much contemplation of, uh, of this stuff. So great. Any thoughts, comments, questions, rebuttals? Everybody's still with me? I do have a question. This is Sandy again. Um, why do you think Akiva, Rabbi Akiva was the only one who was able to be uh, illuminated be or whatever the word would be and not not um, destroyed by the experience. Um, you know, I, I really, um, you know, I, I could not give you an authoritative answer by my senses that, you know, Rabbi Akiva was the greatest sage of that generation. But, you know, he also has a, a very violent death at the hands of the Romans. But, but what do you think the message is for those studying mysticism um, in, in repeating that story? Yeah, um, yeah the, the message is the, the, the danger of, of this practice and, and to discourage people. Um, you know, today, um, mysticism is very much in vogue, um, but, uh, you know, Jewish life, you know, is not, uh, it's a very holistic life without mysticism. Uh, my teacher of halacha, when I was uh, in yeshiva, you know, whenever, um, you, know, uh, you know, something might come up or I might ask about a mystical source, he would change the subject within three sentences. Um, at the same time, um, he and his wife um, had more people to their home for Shabbat dinner, um, more students to their home for Shabbat dinner than any 
three, uh, any other three faculty members combined. So um, it, um, you know, today, um, you know, the, um, the Hasidic world, um, you know, it was a Hasidic revolution in the 1700s. And those that opposed um, Hasidic thought were called the Mitnagdim, Mitnagdim the uh, opponents, and um, they lost. And so when people think of uh, folks who are very orthodox, um, they think of, you know, the different Hasidic groups, but it, it's not, um, and uh, it's pervasive, but it's, uh, it's really not um, the, the center necessarily of normative practice, but, it, but, it, but it's influenced everything. Like, well, Hadodi, it comes from spot um, uh, from the mystics in the 16th century. It reminds me of the tradition where if someone wants to convert to Judaism, the rabbi turns them down, um, what, three times? Times in the tradition, yeah. We don't, we don't do that now, but uh, in the reform movement, but yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and um, the, you know, the Orthodox world is a very holistic world. You know, when, um, when I'm in the Beit Midrash, uh, you know, play a clip of the Beit Midrash uh, where I study in Israel. Um, but like, if there's announcement of like, you know, somebody gets engaged, Everybody breaks out into dancing. The men dance in one circle, the women dance in a different circle. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it's a very organic life. Um, and, um, you know, it was funny because when I was in Skokie, you know, I spent some time studying with a Chabad rabbi, and across the street was um, the, the Kolel, which uh, is, you know, Orthodox this mainstream Orthodox, and, you know, they had nothing to do with each other. Um, you know, they were just, you know, two very different worlds. So we'll get into the sexy stuff at the end here, and we'll get into it more next week. But, um, you know, this is my own thing that um, I, I, you know, like folks to know where it all comes from. Um, so now we're going to begin making um, an intellectual leap. And um, the thing that is important about this intellectual leap is that, um, that I set the screen up properly, um, is um, that we, we are going to you know, make several intellectual leaps as we go along. So the first is um, that um, in our tradition, um, every word in the Torah um, is sacred. And everything is there to teach you uh, um, uh, a lesson. So I'm going to give you an illustration. This is not a mystical text. And Esau ran towards him and embraced him, and he fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. So you see right here these little dots? That's over the word uh, Let me make it a little larger. There are the dots. And um, here is what the text looks like in the Torah. So you can see the dots because there's nothing else there but the dots. So the rabbis need a reason that the dots are there. And they tell a couple of different stories. So one story is um, that, uh, and it says, and he kissed him. There's a difference of opinion about the meaning of this. Some interpret the dots to mean that he did not kiss him wholeheartedly. Um, and there's even a tradition that says Esau tried to bite Jacob when Jacob and Esau were united on the neck, and uh, Jacob's neck turned to stone. 
and um, therefore um, uh, uh, he would the, the dots represent tears. And the other interpretation is that um, the dots mean that he kissed him wholeheartedly. So everything, um, you know, there is anytime there's a repetition of a word, um, there is a meaning behind it. And so this is leading us into the next piece, which is how did God create the world? And um, this is um, one of the earliest works of Jewish mysticism. It's called Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation. And the belief here is that um, God used the letters like the DNA or the periodic table of the world to create uh, the world. Um, I'll just read you a little bit of it to give you an idea. And 32 most occult and wonderful paths of wisdom did Yah, the Lord of hosts, engrave his name, God of the armies of Israel. 32 is 22 letters plus 10 bells. He created the universe in three derivations, writing, Sephir, numbers of four, and speech, Sephira. It's all from the same root. The foundations are 22 letters. Three types of letters are called mothers, seven are called double, and 12 single. The three mothers are Aleph, Mem, and Shin, representing air, water, and fire. Um, go on. Oh, let's read the rest of that. Aleph, mute as water, shin hissing as fire, mem as air of a spiritual type, is as balance standing erect between them, pointing out the equilibrium which exists speaking. They have formed, weighed, transmuted, composed, created with these 22 uh, letters every living being and every soul yet created. So this is an image from uh, the, the type of thing Sefer Yetzirah is talking about. Let me blow it up a little bit for you. So what you see here is the letters are interconnecting um, everything together. There were formed seven doubles. Uh, these are like bet and vet. Bet, gimel, dalit, kaf, pe, resh, tav. Each has two voices, either uh, aspirated or softened. These are the foundations of life, peace, riches, beauty, or reputation, wisdom, fruitfulness, and power. So um, this is a way um, to think of this being actualized. This is a style of writing called mycography. Um, and um, so this is uh, from an artist in Spot. Spot is famous for this, where they take the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and in miniature calligraphy, um, they um, form uh, different, um, different words. So you can see this is uh, the book of Exodus in miniature calligraphy. So Shemot is the name of the book. And then, um, man, it's so much fun having the ability to enlarge like this. And um, you can hopefully just see that there are very tiny letters um, throughout all of this. And um, uh, this is uh, the end. There it's uh, so enlarged that it's blurred.
So, um, so again, these are just, um, you know, what we've done tonight is really, I'm going to uh, save one last text for last. Um, but what we've done is, you know, we've begun to see how is it that the mystic looks at the world, that everything is interconnected, is drawn together by God, but each moment is sacred. And then the mystical journey starts by asking, what is God like? How do I commune with God? And then how did God create the world? And so the whole idea with um, mysticism is that God is continually manifest in the world and we can continually um, know the divine. I'm sorry, what was the takeaway then from the last thing about the words and the dots? What, what is the takeaway there? Yeah, the takeaway is that simply God uses the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to create the world. So, you know, to summarize it very simply, um, the first stratas of mysticism said, you know, God has this image of the divine on the chariot that we can, um, through studying Torah and fasting and meditation, we can ascend up and be able to um, come in contact with the divine. And that can be a dangerous process. And then God uses the Hebrew alphabet to create the world. So that, that's you know, very simply the takeaway from, um, from where we're at tonight. And that um, the Torah on one level is the stories, but there are much deeper levels and meanings um, in Torah, you know, hidden mystical meanings uh, that'll be the last text that we'll look at. And um, that um, that's uh, what we'll get to um, uh, next week. So um, uh, hopefully I'm not being overly intellectual uh, and hopefully I'm being reasonably entertaining. Um, and um, it's not like America's got talent, but um, uh, the season's done until America's got talent superstars. I think it's really helpful when you say the takeaway, after you go through all the stuff and then you say the takeaway, that's really helpful. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Quick, quick and, question. Uh -huh. uh, so for those of us who are looking to uh, commune with God and connect uh, more directly and deeply what can we learn from what you've uh, presented so far and from our tradition about uh, how mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah. So um, what I've presented so far um, is just some foundation pieces. Um, and um, what we'll get into in the next weeks are different ways um, uh, to do that. Um, so, um, the, um, and, um, we connect to the divine in Judaism, um, through prayer, um, and through study and, uh, through sacred deed. And, um, the, but, but here, but it, it's not study it's the difference between Western learning and Eastern learning. And uh, so let me uh, find this video um, and, and play it for you now. Um, so um, in Pirkei Avot, it says, when two people study together, the divine presence rests between them. And um, uh, 
but when we think of study in the um, uh, in the West, we think of going to the reference and reading room and sitting quietly with our books. But that's not Jewish learning. Jewish learning is done with a study partner. And um, so um, that's what I'm going to um, uh, show you now. Um, Pardon me, um, that was the big reveal, but I forgot to set the, um, the system properly. There we go. So this is what it's like when you study in a traditional setting. Seems awful. I can't imagine how they can concentrate. How can you concentrate? So the answer is, um, as long as the people next to you are not talking about the movie they saw last night and are paying it and are talking about the same thing, you can concentrate. <laughs> um, that's a different world than we're used to, right? Um, I love that world. Um, so um, uh, who was it that, that uh, yeah, I, I think my, my screen shifted. So was it Carrie that you asked the question? So, um, you know, the, the ways that we can come in contact with the divine, um, you know, we don't have to learn massive amounts of Hebrew. Um, sometimes it's through sacred chant. Um, uh, is and chant and meditation are a way where not as much Hebrew is needed. Um, and the process, Rabbi Larry Kushner says, I wanted to learn how to dance. And um, he asked his daughter and she said, you just dance. And he said, not if you look like me. And she said, you have to dance with so much of yourself that when the music stops, you're still dancing. So um, that's the experience. But Carrie, I apologize because it sounds like there was more underneath your question that I gave an answer before I really understood your question. Uh, thank you. No, I just... Um... Oh, it wasn't Carrie. It was uh, in the morning walk, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Cecily. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just am interested in any, um, you know, uh, practical suggestions or direction that yeah. you might have. And maybe that's coming in the coming weeks. And I'm happy to be patient. But I uh, was just curious about for those of us looking to have that experience. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be, exp we'll be uh, exploring that. And then, yeah, it may, it may be, I'm deciding what I'm gonna offer um, uh, during the second, uh, you know, uh, second half of the year, but I do offer, I call it more of a workshop than a class on Jewish visions of God. And, um, and then, you know, there are, um, uh, and, you know, for me, it's just, um, you know, having been part of many different types of Jewish communities. 
um, but we'll explore that, uh, you know, all of this a little more. Great. Other thoughts or questions? How many what? weeks um, of the class will there be, Rabbi? Uh, I'm planning on three weeks. Um, if we run a little long, we'll go four weeks. Um, and uh, and I think and we I think we are recording it. So um, if you miss a week, it, you can you can watch the you know the the videotape as the sportscaster Warner Wolf said in Washington D.C. Let's go to the videotape. So um, a quick question about the um, the 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 dimensions of. Um, interpretation of the text um, with regard to uh, that you were talking about. There's different uh, new layers or levels of interpretation um, going from the more um, literal to the more mystical, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, if, and I have a very small memory that the, the first level, the, the literal uh, translation or definition of the words is Peshat. And that's- Yeah, um, so, the traditional levels of interpretation are called pardes. Um, the meaning of the text straightforward is shot. Um, and then um, the next level is remes, which is a hint. And I talk about that as the intertextual level. Meaning how does this story compare to other stories in the Torah? So for instance, anytime a well appears, it means somebody is gonna fall in love. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, in this week's Torah portion, Rebecca's gonna be at the well, you know, she's gonna fall in love. You know, it's kind of like in law and order, anytime somebody get the phone rings, you know, you're getting another piece of evidence in their building the story. Okay. It's actually called the light motif. Um, the third level is drash. And um, uh, Joel Grishaver talks about that level as um, uh, how does this story relate to Jewish history? And then the last level is sowed, which is um, either can be translated as the existential, how does this story relate to me as a person? So with Cain and Abel, I don't necessarily want to, you know, people don't kill siblings, but you know, with Thanksgiving, how many families have someone that's been excised from the Thanksgiving table? And the last, um, that's the existential or the mystical. Um, so um, we're going to draw it together. I probably shouldn't do this because it's like, um, so what's the takeaway from this last text that I'm going to share with you? The takeaway from this text is um, that um, it's showing you how the Torah is not seen literally by the mystics. So there's gonna be all kinds of imagery in it, but takeaway, it's a great illustration of the Torah not being taken literally. It's a really amazing text. And you know, by the way, if people are in, uh, I'll do that later. Um, so, you don't need to, if you try to go and buy a book um, to share with you what I shared tonight, they're, they're really just, it's very hard to, to do. Um, there is, you know, only, there, there is only one book that I would recommend if you want this kind of an overview. Um, and it's called The Everything Kabbalah Book by Mark Elber. Um, and it's because I studied with Mark don't buy Kabbalah for dummies, hmm. um, because that's written by another author who I really like, Arthur Kurzweil, but it doesn't do what Mark's book does. Um, but it's really, the texts are meant to be experienced. So let's experience a little piece of Zohar. So the thing about Zohar is it is not systematic. It's, um, it's poetic. And the way to think about this is to imagine someone that 
is gifted in writing love letters. And um, that um, this love letter, that if you read it, you are channeling their, the person's love for the divine. You're experiencing it um, just through the words. And so Zohar is channeling the love of the mystic uh, for God. Rabbi Shimon said, Woe to the human being who says the Torah presents mere stories and ordinary words. If so, we can compose the Torah right now with the ordinary words, and better than all of them, to present matters of the world. Even rulers of the world possess words more sublime. If so, let us follow them and make a Torah out of them. Ah, but all the words of Torah are sublime words, sublime secrets. Come and see, the world above and the world below are perfectly balanced. Israel below, the angels above. Of the angels it is written, he makes his angels spirits. But when they descend, they put on the garments of this world. If they did not put on a garment befitting the world, they could not endure in this world, and the world could not endure them. If this is so with the angels, how much more so with Torah, who created them and all the worlds, and for whose sake they all exist. In descending to this world, if she did not put on garments of the world, the world could not endure. So it is with Torah. She has a body of the commandments of Torah called the embodiment of Torah. This body is clothed in garments, the stories of the world. Fools of the world look only at that garment, the story of Torah. They know nothing more. They do not look at what is under that garment. Those who know more do not look at the garment but rather the body under the garment. The wise ones, servants of the king on high, those who stood at Sinai, they look only at the soul, the root of all real Torah. In the time to come, they're destined to looking at the soul of the soul of Torah. Man, is that amazing? That's amazing. So the takeaway is that when we begin exploring um, more of the texts of the mystics, there is the outer meaning, but there's the inner and the deeper meaning. And uh, I hope uh, this background that I have uh, chosen for this evening uh, helped you get into the spirit of uh, of the mystic. I got to light a candle, but this is much more fun. Yeah, that was beautiful. I, I'm that struck beautiful. by the use of the feminine pronoun there in that yeah. passage you read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, you know it, it is a very sexual imagery in uh, in Zohar. It's um, uh, Danny, uh, Danny Matt, um, one of his, uh, his main lecture, you know, he, he, uh, Danny, you know, has a series of lectures that, you know, he, he'll give around, but it's called The Divine Feminine. And, uh, you know, we can watch it at some point. Uh, any last thoughts or questions? So, um, uh, we will uh, send out this uh, source book later on. And uh, um, if, uh, you know, I tried to do it as, you know, here's the basic takeaways. Um, and uh, we're just, you know, doing the setup, um, the vision. And, um, and, by, and all of this is, by the way, building to the third session um, where we're going to explore a marvelous piece written by, um, by Art Green. Um, and, but the piece that we're going to read wouldn't make any sense 
without these uh, first sessions uh, to set uh, its uh, uh, as uh, as a setup. Um, and uh, uh, great. Uh, I always like to end with the words uh, Halamot Paz, uh, have golden dreams, everyone. Uh, be well, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Good to see people. Take care, all.